All right, I guess in baseball, this is the cleanup hitter spot. So let's see if I can do at least a, a double, if not a triple. All right. Well, first, I'd like to thank uh, the Epix team uh, for, for their hard work in terms of turning around the conference in terms of uh, their work and their belief in the issue of diversity. Uh, in terms of many themes that we could have given the conference, uh, this was the unanimous theme uh, that we decided would be very good for the campus community to hear. So I'd like to thank Dorota uh, for her leadership, Catherine for her leadership, where's Joyce? Joyce, uh, for all your hard work in terms of really making this a possibility. And again, this is our second annual conference, so thank you, thank you, thank you for having the vision. Um, I also would like to dedicate my uh, brief presentation, because I know it's the last presentation, so I'm definitely aware of that as well, uh, to an unnamed student uh, who I recently found out that uh, one of our former majors, who was actually a former history MA student, uh, who recently got into our educational doctoral program. Uh, and he is kind of the symbol of the type of student who I'm thinking about all the time in terms of our students sometimes in terms of developing our future workforce do need second, third, and fourth chances. Uh, this student as an undergrad was chronically uh, disqualified, uh, was always through extended education coming in, uh, trying to get the student out and in and in and out. And finally, uh, the student uh, graduated uh, with much work and elbow grease. Uh, and the student took a job in a key community organization. Uh, through his work experience, uh, uh, student experience here on campus, uh, he decided to dedicate himself to community service. Uh, and he decided to work for the St. Joseph Ballet, uh, which I think has changed its name to uh, Wood on the Floor, I believe. Uh, for those of you who've seen the St. Joseph Ballet and what their mission is, uh, they take students from Santa Ana community, they take middle class kids, they take white kids, they take Latino kids, but in particular, they take Latino kids um, who are low income, uh, with no classic dance training at all, and by the end of the season, they're doing classic ballet and dance. Uh, I uh, was able to uh, go to their Christmas show a couple of years ago because the student gave me tickets, uh, and it was one of the most moving experiences that I had ever seen considering uh, knowing what I know about the St. Joseph Ballet and who their population was uh, and the fact that they targeted people who you would assume would not be interested in ballet. Uh, and it was very, very moving because I, one of the things that's important about their program is that uh, to be in the program, you also have to go to after school tutoring and, and uh, get help. And if your grades do fall below a certain GPA, uh, you are uh, put through extra tutoring, you're not kicked out, uh, second chances. So it is dedicated to this student today, um, my talk. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about today um, is this very issue of diversity, but a meaningful diversity, a deep diversity, um, a diversity that is both easy to do and difficult to do. And I think uh, today's uh, presenters have all touched on that theme. One of the things that uh, two key structural contexts that we um, have to address when we talk about higher education and diversity is the current economic crisis, right? So we have two competing crises. Uh, the crisis that we will not have a diverse workforce and professional class. And of course, the mainstream, there's no money, right? The no money uh, argument that there's no money for this, no money for that, no money for uh, anything really. So. One of the things that I, I do remind all of us who support the initiative for diversity is that we are f uh, facing one of the most difficult barriers, and that is people want higher education, but they don't want to pay for it in terms of tax dollars, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the second context that I think is equally important is that we who are trying to train people to be part of the diverse workforce have to realize that we must address the issue of where our students come from. And if we look at the map, and I think uh, Rafe's map is very helpful, our students are coming from very, very segregated communities. So when we talk about diversity, I, I want us to remove the idea that diversity is students 
informing and enlightening white administrators and white faculty. That is such the wrong view of diversity. Diversity should be seen as, in a good way, an explosion going everywhere and everybody benefiting from diversity. A two-way, three-way, multi-way uh, uh, causeway in terms of traffic. I want people to see it as a crossing, uh, a back and forth. Uh, many of my Latino students, when they come to Cal State Fullerton, and this is why I say diversity is so important in terms of a complex view of diversity, have never seen or come in contact with white people. And I think if we think of diversity as just a one-way direction, I think we're going to fail. When we start to think of diversity as something that we all have a mutual benefit, that is something that we will all gain from, then I think diversity becomes easy. Now, one of the things that I, I liked about Tuyen's uh, um, presentation is that she points to the easy ways in which we can do some diversity, right? Diversity in our classroom. And I almost could make this the, the, the theme of the talk in terms of uh, diversity and civic engagement starts in the, the classroom and with curricula. Uh, one of the things about the EPIC grant, uh, if I can make a quick aside, um, and again, this is through the genius of uh, uh, Catherine Powers and Dorota Huenziga, when they wrote this uh, grant, was that they addressed the issue of curricula. And having that foresight to understand how do we make our curriculum responsive to our future needs, but also to our student population. So I also, in this uh, talk of thank yous, like to thank my colleagues in history and in Spanish, because we are in the process now of creating a graduate concentration in Chicano studies. And I think this is something very exciting and very innovative because we can now think of not something that is an isolated degree within one department, Chicano studies or ethnic studies, but something that requires the help and work of all. That diversity does not fall on the shoulders of ethnic studies or the faculty or administrators of color, but that we all have an invested interest in making sure diversity succeeds. So simple things, curricula. One of the things about civic engagement is realizing when you construct a syllabus, when you choose your books, when you choose your themes and your courses, this is where the community comes into your classroom. Uh, I always uh, think of my uh, Chicano 190 class, which is a course that we share with the history department. Uh, and one of the most fascinating and moving things about uh, that class, of course, is that students for the first time understand U.S. history through the lens of ethnic diversity. And many students literally kind of have a look on their face that I'm either making it up or I have a horn coming out of my head when I'm lecturing uh, in terms of the contributions of um, diverse populations to U.S. history. But one of the most fascinating things that students do, and I think you have to realize this even if they don't share this with you, is that many times students take their readers, their course packs, they, their printouts from Blackboard, uh, or their books, and they share this with their parents over dinner. And they talk to their parents and they tell them, this is what I learned in my class today. And for many parents, especially for Mexican parents, I do cover some Mexican history in my class. Uh, many Mexicans, even if they go to the third grade in Mexico, uh, gain a very thorough knowledge of Mexican history. Uh, and they actually have a very peaceful but yet combative discussion over the meaning and significance of key historical events. So already we see what we're teaching escape into the community, escape into uh, the uh, public realm. When this last year, uh, I'm a medical anthropologist uh, by training, uh, and in my culture class, uh, I brought in uh, doulas and midwives uh, to address a larger societal problem in the U.S. I wish Marco was here. I'd like to hear what he had to say about this. But one of the key issues for those of us who follow the cultural trends in health and medicine is that uh, one of the largest medical epidemics uh, is the rise in C-sections. Uh, if we look at the C-section rate in 1970, it was at 3%. Uh, now in the U.S., the C-section rate is now nearing 50%. Uh, and I decided to bring in doulas and midwives uh, to give a presentation to the class. And 
And to see this perspective, a perspective that the students do not know of or hear, right? You don't hear this on any television show or, you know, you can't really find it online easily unless you know to look for it. Um, many students began to have a conversation, boyfriends with girlfriends, girlfriends with boyfriends, about alternative ways of giving birth, right? I mean, you think this is a, a heady question in terms of these kids aren't even thinking about having kids yet. But they're already thinking about this and, in fact, taking the pamphlets from the midwife and the doula, uh, and they're actually handing it out to their family members. I've already photocopied the handout, Dr. Gradia, and I've given it to all my cousins who I think might be pregnant. Um, <laughs> they have an eagle eye, these uh, students of mine. Um, but here we see our knowledge escaping our classroom, right? We tend to have a very, is it meeting GE goals? Is it meeting the student learning outcomes for our, our, our department and our major? But we also have to realize that these small acts, these very easy acts, begin to unleash not only diversity, but also civic engagement. People realize that university training has an implication for the real world. Finally, my last class example uh, is a grant exercise that I do in my family class. Um, I've really never written a grant, but one of the things that I absolutely believe that when we create grants and when we write grants, we really have to understand the community needs, not from the perspective of the researcher or the university or an agency, but truly the needs of the community. And so one of the things that we've uh, done in the class is that students have to study a community and figure out what are some of the critical issues and what are some of the assets already in that community. Uh, one of the exercises leading up to the grant I asked the students to pull from their home knowledge, their street knowledge, their organic knowledge, whatever label we want to put on it. Uh, and I asked them, well, if you wanted to do an outreach program uh, for Latino men on prostate cancer, where do you find Latino men in the community? And many times the students feel, well, this is kind of an obvious answer. You know, what if I say the soccer fields on Saturday uh, in my community? Exactly. What if I say, well, there is a local bar in my neighborhood uh, and, and a bunch of Mexican men are in that bar. I take it to the men. So the students are realizing that their local expertise has to be combined with the knowledge they're taking in all of our classes. Um, famously, uh, this project actually does unleash a lot of anger. Uh, because when students uh, want to address the issue of diabetes and obesity, which is a major health issue in the Latino community, um, one of the things I tell the students is, please don't start from the perspective of blaming the victim, right? Because there's this very strange perception that Latinos are obese because of our food, we're always having parties, um, we're just an unhealthy lot of people. Uh, and I instead ask them, to analyze the community so that if the uh, health associations are arguing, well, people must walk or exercise 30 minutes a day to avoid obesity or heart disease or high blood pressure, what the students begin to realize when they begin to analyze, many times the students choose their own communities, I ask them, well, where in Santa Ana can you do a power walk for 30 minutes if you live near Bristol and MacArthur, right? Most of the power walking you will do is avoiding the traffic in these very large streets. We don't make it easy for people in Santa Ana to walk their 30 minutes every day. I then ask them, well, isn't there an LA Fitness in Santa Ana? Well, of course there is. There's a 24 hour fitness, LA Fitness, ballets, et cetera, et cetera. How much is the membership? In Santa Ana, one of the most poorest communities, especially for the Latino community, one of the most poorest communities in the United States, how are they going to afford one gym membership at, even if it's $75 a month? So the students begin to realize that there are some real systemic problems uh, impacting uh, communities. Uh, the end result is, and uh, I'll just tell you some of the gist of the grant, I, I act as if I'm a, a wealthy billionaire benefactor with a lot of guilt. 
Um, and I said, you can ask up for a billion dollars for your grant. Uh, so that you don't have the constrictions of, well, this real grant, you can only spend. I go, there's no, you can spend it on whatever you want to spend it on. Uh, and the students, uh, one of the most interesting things that I find about uh, the students, especially uh, the Fullerton students, is that uh, they really come up with some cutting edge ideas. So the basic agenda is not to become a grant writer, but it's to have the ideas. I think many times we are so limited in terms of we no longer are believing in ideas because we can't do it. You can't do it, you can't do it, you can't do it. Well, for this grant, the exercise is you can't do it doesn't exist as an option. You have to have the imagination to be able to problem solve. And you can't have the imagination to problem solve if you already start with you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. So many times the students uh, de uh, develop and deliver very innovative projects. One of the interesting things uh, that always comes up is the presence of uh, liquor stores and fast food restaurants in poor communities. Um, and in fact, the, the group that was doing the uh, diabetes research found in the city of Maywood, actually, the only safe place to protect you from gangs, drugs, freeway traffic, and pollution was the mega indoor play yard at the McDonald's. This facility is is probably as big as I'm trying to get an idea relative maybe the Ruby Ruby Gerontology Center. It's a huge playground. It's indoor, so the air is clean. It's safe. You're far away from traffic. You don't have to worry about drug dealers. But of course, to be able to use the play yard, you must eat your McDonald's food. Right? It's a, a Faustian deal that we have our, our our poor communities engaged in. So. This issue of curriculum and really presenting our students with real world problems and issues, issues that they confront as they leave our classrooms and go back home. And the key issue here is that they realize they are the solution. They are the answer. So many times the question that comes after that assignment is, then how do we do change? How do I do a career I can tell my mother and father, okay, I'm gonna do something socially responsible. Right? The parent's first thought is, that means you're not going to be paid a lot of money. Right? God forbid it, you say nonprofit. So what we begin to see is students beginning to look for graduate careers where they are engaged in communities. I think it's by no accident that many of our majors in Chicano studies, in particular our male majors, uh, have successfully entered the social work programs at USC and UCLA. Uh, that is one of the key shortages that we see in terms of uh, social work, especially with the growing prison population, growing foster care system. Um, there is a great need for male social workers. Uh, so again, these small, easy exercises that don't require any extra funds, though extra funding would be nice, um, are the small ways that we can actually create change. So one of the interesting last points uh, about the family class that I teach uh, actually came from one of my white students during Christmas. He emailed me during Christmas, which I thought was interesting. Um, but his email centered on the fact that though it was a Chicano family class and I made students analyze their families, uh, not necessarily dirty laundry, but analyze process and structure within their families, uh, my student realized uh, the central focus of women within his family. If it wasn't for his mother, his aunts, and his grandmother, there would be no Christmas. And it became very clear to him in a very small way in terms of how the uh, family event un unfolds every Christmas and every holiday season. Uh, he was so kind of shocked into the readings actually playing itself out in his Christmas celebration uh, that he had to email me on Christmas, which I, I thought was very uh, very kind. In fact, I still see the student and I say, hey, you know, remember grandmother and not just on Mother's Day. Um, so I wrap up my talk with this last issue. Diversity is not about learning about minority communities. Diversity is about the human condition and developing human competency. Dealing with the 21st century student that we have here at Cal State Fullerton and that we need to have well-trained professionals regardless of color 
and we need to have deep and meaningful diversity in order to, ser to serve future challenges and future communities and populations and issues that we have yet to see or witness. So I leave you with that. And again, uh, thank you for everybody who has shown up. Thank you for all the support. And I think that this core of people who are here in the room, as well as people who are not able to be here, I think we're going to be able to make some key changes and transformations that's going to make it better for everybody. So thank you. <laughs>